What do you do when your circuit draws five times more current than it should? In my case, I found out after I soldered the board. I accidentally built something that technically violates the datasheet. This module was built long before I even thought about making a video series. So when I sat down to prepare this episode, I realized there are quite a few things that are just plain wrong. Turns out, every mistake tells a story. So let's dig into my screw-ups and see what we can learn from them. But first, let's see how this thing was actually supposed to work. Welcome to my homebrew 8-bit computer project. I'm building a fully soldered modular system. The system runs on a custom bus I designed myself called Seba1, short, extensible bus architecture. In each episode I'm creating a new module, I.O., memory, audio, graphics, and eventually a custom CPU. But please keep in mind, I'm not an expert, I'm just learning by doing. In this episode I'll show you the first working module, the Seba1 bus debugger. Let's dive in. So, what exactly is a bus debugger? It's like a logic analyzer, but, um, chunkier. In short, it monitors the address and data lines on the Seba1 bus in real time, displays the current values on seven segment displays, and indicates bus operations like read and write cycles with a simple LED. You could totally build something like this with an Arduino, push the data to a serial console and call it a day. But for me, the fun is in figuring out the logic puzzle, how to wire real TTL chips together so it all clicks. The module constantly listens to the Seba1 bus, capturing both the 24-bit address and the 8-bit data. To display these values in hexadecimal, I split them into nibbles, 4-bit chunks representing a single hex digit. That gives me 6 digits for the address and 2 for the data, 8 characters total. Each one is handled in sequence. To do that, I use a 74LS163, a 4-bit binary counter. I only need 3 bits of it, which gives me a cycle of 8 steps, one for each digit to be displayed. The counter is clocked by a classic NE555 timer, running at around 490 Hz. That's fast enough to cycle through all the digits and create a stable image, thanks to persistence of vision. Each 4-bit chunk gets decoded one at a time. All the bits from all the nibbles are wired into multiple independent LS151 8-input data selectors, also known as multiplexers. The 3-bit counter we mentioned earlier selects which input line is active, and the LS151 passes its value to the EEPROM's address pins. To wrap it up, let's see how I managed to pack all of this onto a single PCB. At the bottom you can see the IDC40 connector and the power input. Just above it, there's the clock signal generator for the bus. I'll cover that later. Next up is the block of data selectors, and to the right of that, the EEPROM holding the segment data. Above that is the counter with its own clock, and to the right, a demultiplexer with a buffer, which I'll also explain in a moment. Finally, there's the IDC16 connector that links to the display panel. There's one more twist to how the EEPROM works. I added two more control lines from the Seba1 bus. A4 is connected to the reset line, which is active low, and A5 is connected to the read signal. Together that gives us 64 total addresses, split into four 16-byte blocks depending on the state of reset and read. When reset is high and read is high, we show the actual hex digit. When reset is high and read is low, we show the hex digit plus a red write indicator. Reset low always shows all eights, even during writes. All display segments are connected through current limiting resistors. So I just realized that instead of using an external LED wired to the right line of the bus, I basically over-engineered it into the lookup table. Like what the heck? Alright, back to the seven segment displays and my design choices. To decode digits, I could have used a decoder like the 74LS47, but that chip only handles BCD. Decimal values from 0 to 9. Anything above that is just a mess of undefined outputs. Like, what is this? Using an EEPROM gave me full control over each digit, and let me keep the design simple and flexible. Maybe someday I'll revisit this with a GAL or PAL chip, something programmable, but more compact. But for now, the EEPROM does the job just fine. I haven't mentioned yet how only one display is active at a time. Since all the displays are common cathode, the one we want to light up has to be pulled low. That's where the 74LS137 comes in, a 3 to 8 demultiplexer that takes the current value from the 74LS163 counter and activates a single low output line. 
So as the counter steps through the digits, the 137 enables them one by one. That low signal goes through a 54LS245 buffer before pulling down the cathode line of the selected digit. I wasn't able to capture this exactly in Logisim, but I hope you get the idea. I built this whole thing on a breadboard first, and it worked great. Then I soldered the final board, stepped back, looked at it, and asked myself, Wait, did I just make a huge mistake? Do you know what I'm talking about? Here's the catch. If you add up the current for all seven segments of a single digit, you're looking at roughly 15 milliamps per segment. That's over 100 milliamps total, all flowing through one single pin of the 54LS245 buffer. That's over 100 milliamps total, all flowing through one single pin of the 54LS245 buffer. That's way beyond spec. The datasheet lists about 24 milliamps maximum sync current per pin, and I was pushing four or five times that. Oh wait, well actually, it's 12 milliamps for the military grade version, according to the datasheet. So, um, at this point, I was basically daring the chip to give up. But here's the weird part. It worked. Even after hours of runtime, the 74LS245 stayed just warm, but never dangerously hot. I had a theory that the multiplexing helped, since each output is only active for about 2 milliseconds at a time, and then gets 14 milliseconds of rest, maybe that duty cycle made all the difference. So I tested it. I pulled the 555 timer and ran the display without any multiplexing at all, keeping one digit lit the whole time, and it still didn't overheat. I also tested other buffer variants, 74 HCT245 and standard 74 LS245, and all of them worked fine under real conditions. But in the end, I went with the 54 LS245 for the final version, partly because its metal case helps dissipate heat better, and partly because, well, I just have a whole pile of them. The verdict? The LS series is tough. And while the module works, I'm not exactly proud of this setback, especially since this was my first real board. I'll treat this as a live experiment to see how long the components hold up. And maybe someday, like I already mentioned, I'll try to rebuild this module using programmable array logic and proper LED drivers. Got a better idea for handling that current syncing? Maybe a ULN2803? Or some other 8-channel driver? Drop your suggestions in the comments. I'd love to hear what you would do. Oh, and there's one more thing I squeezed onto the board. I added a 16 MHz crystal oscillator along with a 74LS161 binary counter as a frequency divider. Using a jumper, I can select between 16, 8, 4, 2 or 1 MHz clock outputs, all tapped directly from the counter's outputs. That selected clock gets fed into the SEBA 1 bus as the system clock signal, and if I leave the jumper disconnected, I can supply an external clock instead, perfect for future experiments. Of course, I'm not expecting this machine to run at 16 MHz, or even 8. Right now, I've managed to get my 65C02 running stable at 4 MHz, and that's probably fast enough for what I'm building here. If you've made it this far, thank you for watching. The next module will be something even more fundamental, connecting the actual 65C02 CPU and handling input from a keyboard and output to an LCD display, just like in Benita's setup. And until then, keep building, keep learning, see you in the next episode.